Hi, I'm Mark Zippet, Crocker Farm Auction. We have an outstanding sale plan for you running from July 25th to August 4th with a phone bid session on August 5th. Uh, Stoneware and Redware are one of the hottest things right now in the Americana market. And we want to thank you personally for being a part of it. Uh, starting off this sale, you can see some very nice miniatures that we'll be selling, including this exceptionally rare presentation piece made for Charles Hart's daughter, Ordelia Hart. And see, it's very whimsical in the, in the use of impressions on it. We have the tips of keys impressed around the rim. We have dollar signs, which is fantastic, around the shoulder. Slip trailed spots. Of course, her name, O Heart. The handles are very delicate. Screw head terminals, rope twist form. The top of this piece is extraordinary as well. You can see just how finely that is made and decorated an amazing survivor that this was given to a potter's daughter when she was a child and that it survived even with this intact you can tell it was a prize family piece the hearts of course one of the foremost families of potters in new york state and charles hart uh produced a lot of iconic designs very special piece we have some other nice Small examples, including this New York State decorated jug, this very rare decorated bottle, probably Albany, New York, made for J.F. Whitney. A nice bank. The tooled finial. I have a beautiful example, actually a couple in here, of early Manhattan or New Jersey jugs. And one thing that, that sets this piece, as well as the next piece I'm gonna show you apart from some of the later 18th century jugs is the tolling on the spout. We can use this as an example. This type of spout on this jug with this heavy tolling dates about 1795, maybe 1805. But these spouts that have more simplistic tolling just around the top, a little bit wider mouth, are exceptionally early. I mean, you're talking 1780s, maybe 1770s, could be even a little bit earlier than that. This is potted in a great small size. Of course, the iconic watch spring or cog motif of the period is being used. You can see that boldly decorating the base of the handle as well. A special little piece. Another one that I wanted to show you. Again, a little bit earlier, or potentially a fair bit earlier than, than you would expect from Manhattan is this piece. And again, another thing that suggests an earlier data manufacturer, they were playing around with these different colored slips. We've seen greens and browns and reds and different colors. This is this very interesting, uh, almost like a, a dark brown or olive slip that you just don't really see. Uh, this treatment to base the handle, again, indicates an early period of manufacture. Uh, beautiful small size jug. Happy to have it in this auction. We are always excited about new discoveries and always hope to have some new discoveries that advance scholarship in our auctions. And this is one such piece. This beautifully decorated picture is marked Holmes, Georgetown, DC for potter Samuel Holmes, circa 1820. He was a Baltimore trained potter, probably one of the formative figures that was lost to history in the Baltimore stoneware craft. Uh, this is the only piece signed by Samuel Holmes that we've seen. It's probably the finest example of stoneware made in DC proper, if we're excluding Alexandria, of course. Um, really beautifully decorated with this PAR-inspired Baltimore design. Exceptionally early, like I said, 1820, you normally date these types of designs to closer to 1825, sometimes maybe even 1830. And so it makes you wonder, was Holmes one of the creators uh, of this design. And we, we say it's par in Baltimore, but could it be that Holmes actually was uh, one of the people that, that kind of put this design into the decorative vocabulary of Baltimore potters? Really beautifully potted as well. You can see just how thin walled it is. An exciting new discovery. Any Anytime you get a, a new maker's mark discovered, uh, particularly one made south of the Mason-Dixon line, it's something to really take note of. The great selection of 20th century face vessels, some, some very nice brown family pieces, this very rare small sized face jug 
was made by E.J. Brown, one of the itinerant members of the Potting family. Uh, and you can see it has this wonderful inscription on the bottom. He made this at the Choctaw Indian Pottery in Marion, Virginia. He put this cryptic date, 1884, on the bottom, actually several decades prior to when this was actually made. And I think he's sort of hearkening back to, to an older time period. He's kind of saying, uh, you know, this is a whiskey jug made uh, with some kind of old timey whiskey in it. And um, he's sort of playing around with that notion. Uh, but it's, it's a very interesting thing to see that that archaic date on there. Exceptionally rare as well to find any of these brown pottery face vessels with a hand and size inscription. Really special piece. Another nice earlier period brown pottery face vessel, Arden, North Carolina. Unusual depression around here. You can imagine the potter taking this piece when it was still relatively soft and applying that mouth and it created that pressure around there. Uh, really great profile, wonderful folky piece. Another early brown piece, you can see kind of the, the, uh, the development of the craft, much like with Lanier Metters, as things changed and got more advanced as they made more and more of these. This one's possibly Georgia or possibly very, very early, uh, mid 18, uh, mid 1920s uh, when the family moved to Arden. You see it has no ears has these depressions right here. It's also a wider body stance. See just how squat that is. As time progressed, you'd start to see a narrower base, a little more detail. Um, also of note are the, the number of teeth. It's really uh, remarkable how many teeth this has, um, these broken uh, porcelain teeth. Beautiful piece. Here's an Otto Brown. Made sometime around the third quarter of the 20th century. Very rare piece in that it includes a cigar in the, in the figure's mouth. And again, we have this multi-tooth mouth, this Roman nose. I mean, it almost looks like some of the uh, earlier Edgefield pieces uh, that you see from the, from the Bainham's or Miles Mill. Incised mustache, ears, eyes with pierced pupils. Otto Brown's work is a little bit more difficult to find than some of the other Brown family members, so this is an exciting piece to have. Um, one piece, it could be a, a very, very early Cheever Matters. We have it cataloged as Casey Matters, which is also a strong possibility. This brown glazed face jug, you can see uh, the potter has put large pieces of quartz in the eyes. This is a classic uh, Cheever Matters treatment. Very, very folky piece. It appears to have deliberately offset eyes, crudely incised eyelashes. And this is definitely an earlier piece, probably first quarter 20th century, before these things really started kicking into mass production. Uh, we have some interesting New York jars here. A nice druggist jar for a New York City merchant. An exceptionally rare jar made for a female tobacconist in New York City, Mrs. C.B. Miller and Company. It has original paper label, as well as uh, some of these other applied uh, pieces of paper. Um, really special piece. Look how cool that label is. Best Virginia. We have, the, of course, the Native American there holding the tobacco. Beautiful little pickles jar. One of the iconic... Clarkson and Crolius forms. We have pickles stamped in bold letters. Nice border around here. It's a little bit more unusual because it has the Crolius rosette. And I think the New York Historical Society actually has this rosette um, or one like it uh, in their possession, the exact stamp used. Um, but it's neat how he actually kind of did that second flower around it. Couple other pieces here from further afield. Very rare Western PA canning jar made for the Maysville, Kentucky merchant firm of N. Cooper and Power with nice and size banding and of course that classic stripe decoration you find from Western PA. Another very cool piece, an attributed McCoy elephant head crock. Very rare design. Anytime you get into elephants, you're talking uh, something very special. And uh, this you can see based on the brushwork, the overall color of this piece. 
The style of the application is a firm attribution to William McCoy, uh, who of course is a Manhattan potter. And his pottery, you'll see some of the more interesting and exotic animals and figural designs that uh, produced in entire 19th century America. Moving along, some very nice Bacon Level Alabama earlier period alkaline glazed jars with that distinctive iron slip decoration that is so desirable among collectors. Beautifully glazed pieces. A newly discovered attributed Airy Metters vase of exceptionally large size, 1960s time period. We see this, this lily pattern as well as this flying bee. It includes its original lid, which is remarkable. And she's decorated that with this spire and orb finial. A very rare piece of Ohio pottery that uh, almost verges on art pottery, this Oakwood pottery uh, monkey pitcher, very much inspired by Majolica from the period. He's holding this coconut or egg, brown glaze over yellow clay, interesting green striping to one side. And we have the signature on the bottom Oakwood, missing the K, pottery, Dayton O. L great late 19th century piece where they're kind of pushing utilitarian pottery to a, to a further artistic craft. An interesting brown pottery, mid 20th century face harvest jug. You just don't see this form from this period. You're typically just gonna see the single spouted jugs. This is a double spouted face jug with rainbow handle. Unusual unglazed surface. Again, we have that heavily toothed mouth. A later period Lanier Metters face jug. A little bit unusual in that it's dated on the bottom, actually. You can see it's uh, got that 1987 date on it. Extremely rare torso vessel owned by the great collector Tony Shank at one time. And uh, he strongly attributed this to Florida, possibly from where it was found. Uh, we have a brown dip to the top, salt glaze to the surface. Unusual in that it does not have a spout in the top. It was thrown as a lobed, almost as somebody would make a bank or a chick water or something like that, just kind of like a beehive form with a pinch here. And then the potter has elaborately manipulated it and applied clay to make the spout form the figure's mouth. An early label on it suggests that it was in a, a museum exhibit at one point, property of Mrs. H. Eaton, 132 Elm Street. Uh, this came out of the venerable Michael Hall collection, uh, known for having uh, an extraordinary collection of folk pottery and other leading examples of American folk art. Very honored to be selling his things in this sale. Uh, here's another new discovery. This is the uh, second intact Tilden Easton jar from Alexandria known. It features Tilden Easton's decoration as seen on shards recovered from the site, but more importantly, it features his distinctive little one gallon capacity mark. Uh, Tilden Easton's pottery is only known from one marked milk pan that's intact, as well as a number of shards from the site that bear this design. A nice selection of sewer tile, including this figure, maybe a railroad worker, something like that that actually includes a removable hat. Very cool. The skull, kind of macabre, but also very interesting. Uh, moving along, uh, we have some outstanding examples of uh, Midwestern pottery headlined by this massive frog inkwell. This is made by Wallace and Cornwall Kirkpatrick of Anna, Illinois. Typically, you'll find this form, uh, the frog modeled in a much smaller size on a simple dome base or a clamshell base. This one's exceptionally large, it features his throat sack engorged like he's ready to make a call. Exceptional in sizing and detail. He's got spots almost like a leopard frog in size lines. These type of treatments you don't typically see on the frog inkwells. And then what really 
uh, sets this apart is the face. You have him sitting on a man's head and he's in a state of shock. You can see his mouth's open, the mouth, of course, forming the opening to the well. He has an implied nose and the rest is freehand incised and highlighted in cobalt slip. We see this cross hatching so typical of Wallace and Cornwall's work. Uh, this again is another political piece. So we have him talking about presidential campaigns, reform in 1876, and then, oh, surprise, 1884, reform again. So this typical trope of politicians talking about how things need to be reformed all the time. They run on this reform ticket. If you've ever seen the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? They're talking about getting the reform. Like that's uh, a typical thing that politicians are gonna use to get votes. And so they're poking fun at politicians here. We have more inscriptions, same old croaker written on the bottom of it. Again, a reference to the idea of you're, you're repeating this same old line about we need some reform and then wind, wind coming out of the throat sack as if you know the, they're, they're blowing hot air. Here's the bottom, you can see it's fully salt glazed and we have this nice Anna Pottery, by Anna Pottery inscription on the back. This is uh, the best inkwell by Wallace and Cornwall Kirkpatrick that we've ever, ever offered. Very excited to get it. Another sort of Anna inspired piece, Temperance Jug. This is classic Boonville, Missouri uh, form and construction and incising. We have a rustic surface carved all over it after it's been dipped in a, a reddish brown Albany slip. Three snakes decorate this piece. Nice, nice form, almost looks like an early onion bottle. And one thing that I love about these, these uh, Boonville snake jugs is that the snakes all have different patterning on them. So this example is chip carved going around his body. Got those spots on it. This next example has these V-shaped patterning. Uh, and then the, the last one has these just kind of large scales going around it. Made in the late 19th century in Boonville, Missouri. This is a, a great example of a, uh, a regional form. Uh, we also have a piece that was featured on the Antiques Roadshow. This one really has a lot of bells and whistles. I'll probably be spending a decent amount of time on this. Um, of course, it's a harvest jug, but we, we have these, it's kind of body. We have breast form spouts. This is where the, the uh, liquor would be poured out of. So you imagine some guys sitting around in, in their bar and their, their social club, whatever, their society, drinking out of this and having a field day with it. Um, they'd be filling it here and then pouring it out of here. Uh, it says Old Rye Whiskey on the front, so there's little doubt what it was used for, but then we have it placed below a cross, so there's sort of this, this tension, this kind of social play that, that uh, a cross is featured, you know, largely associated with temperance, but then, of course, they're drinking whiskey out of it, so it's sort of, you know, giving them a chuckle. Uh, Christytown Pottery Works, exceptionally rare, Maker's Mark uh, from Ohio. Uh, I can't recall uh, seeing another piece from the Christie Town Pottery. And then we start to get into other more interesting things. Second Amendment jug, the right to bear arms. Uh, maybe it, it means if you steal my whiskey, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> you know, this might have been in a saloon or something like that. I, I really think that this was kind of a... a uh, an object used to, to hold whiskey was utilitarian, but this was probably a real, a real conversation piece wherever this was displayed. A lot of craftsmanship went into it. We have a date here, November 27th, 1883. William Rose, Brandt did some excellent research, listed in the catalog. He actually found out who that was. This is the owner of the jug, not the maker. And we have hearts going around here at the shoulder. These triangular waffle cut designs here, more hearts at the base, and then what really takes the cake when you flip it over, yeah, when you flip it over, the user moons the, the viewer, the, the friends sitting around drinking with this man. He'll tip it up like this to drink or, or pour it this way. Uh, and then you have that, that rear end of the man there as a joke. So it's almost like the Anna Pottery shoe fly jugs where you, you tip it over and the lady's wearing no underwear or some of these other things you'll see where the, the tipping of the object produces an image. Very, very wonderful folk art piece. People love Ohio 
uh, harvest jogs. It's, it's for whatever reason a popularly produced form out in that region. And this is one of the most ambitiously decorated examples we've ever sold. Here's a great uh, jug made from a female potter to another female potter, uh, another, or, I'm sorry, female friend, uh, DeSoto McClintock. And there's an inscription about ha uh, being uh, the first jug uh, that they turned. And then uh, the name Jenny Price, Mount Sterling, Illinois. Uh, a neat thing, it's, it talks about a, a certain code they had between themselves. And you actually see incised on here, we have these, these symbols. And so apparently these two friends, maybe since childhood, had some kind of secret language that they wrote code uh, messages to each other in. Very, very neat piece. Kind of heartwarming, personal, sentimental object. We have a great example of a Cowden and Wilcox batter pail. This, of course, bears probably the most famous design of Cowden and Wilcox, and that's the man in the moon. So to combine this form, this desirable spouted form, with the man in the moon motif is really kind of a, a, a double whammy, if you will. Um, great, a great, great rendering, large rendering of that face. Very unusual sideburn applied to this person. Occasionally you'll see rare treatments on, on man in the moon designs. You know, very rarely you might see a hat, you might see a mustache, uh, you might see something a little bit different. To have the sideburn is exceptionally rare. Uh, when you flip it around to the front, we have this very nice double wreath motif. Really beautiful piece. Harrisburg stoneware is some of the most prized uh, stoneware in the market right now. The market is, is really amazing for it. And this is one of the best batter pails that come to auction in years. Some Simeon Bray uh, temperance jugs will be sold in this sale. We're, we're actually gonna be selling three of them. It's, it's really remarkable if you have just one, that's, that's a thing. There's actually three of them in this auction. They're all a little bit different. This is an exceptionally rare example in that it's salt glazed and cobalt decorated. We have a snake attaching, uh, attacking the arm of a monkey. That's its heads plunged in the vessel. Again, this is based in the Anna Pottery style, the Bray brothers. It's believed they all worked at the Kirkpatrick's Pottery in Illinois. And then when they went out on their own, uh, they, they took that style with them. This is believed to be made in Evansville, Indiana by Simeon Bray. Another snake's attacking the other arm. We have the head plunged into the neck, as you would see on all these other Anna vessels where the figure's trapped, maybe his head's coming out, or he's called a nice young man going in, as, as the Kirkpatrick would say, and he's plunged in the vessel consumed by the alcohol. Snakes are applied here. We have a lizard or a salamander. Again, very rare to find these salt clays. Also rare to find them in this size. This is one of the larger ones uh, that we have seen. A really special uh, example. Another piece that serves as a Rosetta Stone for Simeon Bray's work is this very special jug with a full-bodied monkey. You see the monkey smiling. He's kind of mischievously checking out the spout. We have a turtle applied here, a snake and a lizard. Incised rustic surface resembling tree bark. Then we have B, 1885. And maybe the B could stand for Bray, but then we have the smoking gun right here on the bottom, Bray, 1885. Uh, very special piece. This is the only one that we're aware of, and there's only maybe 10 or so of these Bray jugs known that actually says Bray on it. It's a very, very cool thing. Uh, another one in the back, exceptionally large. We have this stylized, almost ghostly image of a man peeking out kind of fearfully with this very thick, robust snake handle. Incised bark surface, Albany slip glaze, unusual yellow glaze to the snake and to the face. And just like that, uh, Jug had the incising on it. This is SLB for, for Simeon L. Bray. Bottom, SB 1885. So these were made in the same year. Um, a great, a really great selection, a really interesting body of work that shows the uh, 
influence of potters and how they take those those styles as they as they as they go on, on their way and pot in different states. There's an, another iconic Anna form. This is an Anna dog doorstop. These spaniels were produced by a number of potters throughout America in both redware and stoneware, inspired by Staffordshire England spaniels. This we know is Anna because of the distinctive cross hatching on the base and the glass eyes. Look at these wonderful yellow eyes. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing that the Kirkpatricks took their craft to a level where they're actually putting dimples where the eyes would go on some of their figural forms and then fitting them with glass eyes. Great example. Here's a related example. Anna or Texarkana skull. Beautiful light colored clay with cobalt and brown glaze. You can see this is on a much taller base. Um, kind of a kind of a cruder tapered base. A couple other pieces headed out towards the west is a rare Minnesota bottle from New Ulm. It's an exceptionally rare jar. Brant did some great research on this and determined W.J. Bailey was actually a Canadian trained uh, early Galena, Illinois potter that actually ended up uh, by his early 1820s potting uh, in Galena. Of course, when we think of Galena potter, we think of moon jugs, large yellow slip spots, yellow dips, mottled uh, orange and green clay. This we feel is possibly the earliest signed example of Galena redware known. Very, very stylish with this uh, carved stepped rim and these ring handles. A couple nice pieces of George Orr, including his well-known puzzle mugs, a great salt glazed pig bottle by Wallace and Cornwall Kirkpatrick of Anna, Illinois. This is one of the Black Hills pigs that talks about the route to the Black Hills of California. Classic Anna penmanship with these tails you see on the B's and the A and the P. And then underside has that railroad route all the way to the Black Hills. And of course, because the Kirkpatrick's like to be inappropriate sometimes, we have the Black Hills written right here. A really nice Midwestern salt glazed lamb figure. Some beautiful examples of Harrisburg stoneware, including this fantastic one gallon Calvin and Wilcox circa 1865 jar with this wonderful cross shaped foliate design emanating from a spot combination of factors makes this a great piece. It's a really desirable size, one gallon, and the coverage of the design is exceptional. Um, really nice piece. Condition is fabulous too. Half gallon Calden pitcher, a nice one gallon Calden grapes. You typically don't see uh, grapes on one gallon. And then this really nice John Young bearing the simple mark, Harrisburg PA, uh, Kate Croc. Tough, a tough form to find from this city with really nice blue on it. There's a rare Midwestern stoneware temperance jug of unusual large size with a Rockingham type glaze. This one's very uh, vocal, a little less subtle in, in decrying the evils of alcohol. We don't just have a snake, but we actually have a skull and crossbones applied to it. I mean, a rare treatment for a temperance jug. A beautiful Eastern Pennsylvania redware jar. Tough to find examples with more decoration. This is a really beautiful example. Of course, the Pennsylvania German tulips are depicted on here. The stylized daisy motif. Take a look at those handles, Brian, if you can get those handles. Really beautiful cross hatching. Three colors of slip are used. The green is copper. This cream color is a lighter clay that they found, maybe a pipe clay. And then this is manganese. We have a copper band below the rim. 
and this circumferential slip trailing around the base. Really beautiful piece. This reminds me of a lot of things that you'd see uh, in a museum, maybe the Philadelphia Museum of Art or Winter Tour, but not many of these are in private hands. Two other very nice examples of Cowden and Wilcox somewhere. This one I want to show to you because it features an unusual decorated handle that you don't typically see on their work. This berry and floral motif is also unusual. We also have a one gallon Cowden and Wilcox bird. Anytime you find a bird on a one gallon, you're, you're talking an exceptionally rare piece. Nicely executed tail, this little pussy willow design or whatever you want to call it coming off the stump is, in a, is a nice little addition. Beautiful piece. Got some 20th century Jacob Medinger redware with incised designs. A rare Jay Blaney Western PA copper glazed redware jar. Look at that beautiful glaze. It looks very New Englandy, but actually see is the J.L. Blaney Cookstown PA mark. Very early example of Western PA pottery. A nice large sized salt glaze stoneware spaniel. Bears some similarities to smaller spaniels produced in, in uh, Harrisburg, and that's, that's possibly where this one was made. Some other nice small pieces, including a beautiful redware dog. You can look at this dog here. Has uh, unusual double impression of the collar. It survives in excellent condition. You typically don't see this condition on these figures. Beautifully decorated cake or butter crock with an inscription, sponge decoration, original lid, a face pipe, communal face pipe. Moving along, some more Pennsylvania redware. We have a, a good selection of Philadelphia slipware, including this beautiful plate, similar examples in the Met. And even the example in the Metropolitan Museum of Art has that uh, distinctive raised ridge around there from the mold that they use. But, Beautiful arched. You can just see the exuberance of the design that you just don't really see in later 19th century Philadelphia plates. This is, you know, clearly an 18th century example. And then another early treatment that's very prized that you don't really see later on is this use of a brushed copper accenting it. Very special piece. Another earlier period, a little bit later than this, but, but still earlier than you typically see uh, loaf dish with this unusual crosshatch design. A Matawan, New Jersey plate, I'm sorry, a loaf dish, great form. Uh, and the, the bird's a little more unusual than you typically see, he's actually got a crest. You can see this comb here, he's almost like a rooster rather than just a typical bird that you see. A PA or possibly New Jersey loaf dish, Philadelphia loaf dish, this one is really beautiful. You can see it's got a lot of pizzazz to it. Uh, Pennsylvania plate, Another Pennsylvania plate with really nice looping designs. This plate, uh, exceptionally rare, Pennsylvania origin, and we tried to lock down who this person was, Robert Barkley, uh, and we could not because there's a number of them, but you can see uh, it's actually dated with an 1850s date, uh, sixth month, I believe it says uh, 24th, 25th, something like that. Um, Possibly Lancaster area. There was also an African-American artist living in Philadelphia by that name. So uh, regardless of who it was made for, anytime you see a presentation dish like that, it's something to take note of. Two iconic pieces of flint enamel wear by Lyman Fenton and Company, mid 19th century, Bennington, Vermont. We have the lion with applied coleslaw mane, and we have the poodle uh, holding the basket of fruit. A really great early period uh, Frederick Carpenter jar made in Charlestown, bearing the desirable Boston 1804 mark. But this form is fantastic. It's almost like an early rendering of a Boston bean pot or a sugar jar or something of that nature. Um, you can see the open handled uh, style to the potting. Uh, it had a, a lid at some point, whether that was pottery, who knows. Typical brown dip 
that you see on Carpenter's Wear, that English style is really coming through. And uh, as I said, the form's fantastic. You just don't see this form. A really nice whiskey jug. You have a New York Stoneware Company bearing the bold inscription, Old Rye. Very cool. Exceptionally rare one gallon jar with a slip trail dog. This is the only Edmonds and Company. This is a Charlestown, Massachusetts mark from the mid uh, 19th century. This is the only Charles uh, Edmonds dog that we've ever seen. Occasionally you'll still find a deer. You might see some birds, some interesting uh, floral vining designs, some heart shaped emblems, but to see a dog is, is, is very special. And again, it's not in that, that typical style that you'll see on this deer uh, where he's just doing a lot of these vertical strokes. Beautifully decorated jar by Henry Atchison of New Geneva, PA. Tulips going around it, great size. They've incorporated those stripes that are so ubiquitous in Western PA pottery on it and beautiful color as well. An extremely rare signed Western Pennsylvania harvest jug. Hard to find this form from that region, but significantly harder to find its sign. This actually bears the mark of Jay Weaver from Beaver, Pennsylvania. We have this floral wreath motif on one side and then also on the reverse. People love harvest jugs. Again, we're talking that, that uh, beehive form with the two spouts and the rainbow handle in the middle. This example has kind of a, a disc or button shaped finial, but uh, to find one of these at all is special, but to find it bearing, bearing the potter's mark is really uh, something to take note of. A great jar attributed to Stephen Ward, West Brownsville, PA. Classic eagle motif that you find on Western Pennsylvania stoneware, but, it, but again, it's gone over the top in embellishment with these uh, stripes going above it and below it. And again, as you see so often in Western PA, and we'll see it in the piece, I'll just show you, they're, they're alternating the, the straight stripes with this wavy pattern. This is an unusual example. It's a desirable canning jar form. They would put a tin lid on this and seal it with wax and uh, keep it in a root cellar or basement. It would have preserves in it, some kind of preserved fruits or vegetables. But um, you can see what, what makes this example special is just the number of stripes on it. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight stripes going on it. So people love stripers. This is one of the better stripe decorated canning jars you can find. Another canning jar, Star Pottery, and that's Hamilton and Jones from Greensboro. An unusually large canning jar with this very interesting flowering plant motif. A TF Rappert from New Geneva with a desirable Federal Eagle motif. And then we have some additional redware down there. Moving along, some smallish sized stripe decorated canning jars, an extremely rare Master Salt from Shinston, West Virginia. It's got that vining that you associate with the West Virginia and Western PA style, but the way in which this striping is done, where it's forming these, uh, and this vining is done, where it's forming these, these graduated uh, stripes that don't curve at all, can be firmly attributed to Shinston, West Virginia. Of course, A. Conrad was working there for a period um, really special piece though, and even the base, let me get the base in this. You can see just the, how nicely done the base is. And I don't know if we're getting a, a glare or, can you get that okay? Yeah. Here's a special form. These are highly prized in the area. This is a really rare small size spaniel, but you can tell by the color of the fire clay and the cobalt this is 100% a Western Pennsylvania piece. Some real masterworks from Western PA, uh, including a Spaniel Winter Tour, another that sold privately years ago, are these large size Spaniels on these hand-thrown bases. This is a smaller piece, probably made as a child's toy, but it has that Western PA or even West Virginia style slash decoration that you'll see on some of the pieces, some of the wheel-thrown pots made in that area. Beautiful color, great form, excited to have that. 
This match safe came out of Morgantown, West Virginia, and was quite possibly made there. We have a Albany slip dip, the upper body. It's wheel thrown, it's not molded like you would typically see on those late White's Utica match safes. And then we have coggle designs. Of course, when you think of the coggling, it's so well known from the Thompson Pottery in Morgantown. The match could be striked on this rough surface and then we have this decorative braided coggling going around it. This is one of the most heavily decorated spittoons we've ever offered. Palatine, West Virginia. We know that based on the styles of the stencils. In this case, it's a rose with a star in the center coming around the top. And then the sides are decorated with more roses, including here's one again that has that star in the center. And these bluebells hanging off. An elaborate stenciling going around here with a couple different, a few different types of flowers represented. Great piece. Rare AP Donahoe Parkersburg Bowl, a small Remy picture. Here's a Hig Chick Waterer featuring that Bristol glaze that he liked to use. This is made in Philadelphia by Thomas Haig Jr. Some other potter, including Rockingham Ware and a probable Tucker pitcher uh, from Philadelphia. We have a great selection of, of Shenandoah pottery, and I'll be getting to that more in a second. But uh, one of the things that we have that's, that's really nice are these two pitchers that must have been made on the same day or same week, same time period. Uh, remarkable in that they both have that squat that fat body form, and then this light sea green copper, the manganese, and the cream colored slip that it's been dip in, dipped in looks the same. Um, a really nice pair. You typically don't see these things in pairs. Selection of Strasburg mugs. So Strasburg pitchers, here's a really nicely colored example. Probably S. Bell and Son. Here's an example in the back that's larger that's based on the, the, the lack of a, a yellow slip coating in it. It's, it's orange with uh, brown and green on it. I've seen a few things stamped Everly with that mark, with that glaze, and that's probably what that is. It's probably an Everly pitcher, but great size and usually large. Moving along, we have some great Additional Strasbourg pottery, as I was mentioning, including this delicate vase. This treatment at the top is very unusual. Beautifully crimped. With this heavy base. You see right here, very densely potted at the base. Um, classic multi-glaze. From Strasbourg, probably J. Everly and Company. We sold a couple Everly vases with some applied work. We also sold one that had a, a brushed eagle on it. But if you're talking just standard multi-glaze produced by the Bells and Everly's in Strasbourg, this, this uh, is the best vase that we've ever handled. We have another one right here, and you can see how these potters would get a little different, a little creative in their style. This one, again, has that very heavy base, but is missing the crimping at the top. Three colors are used. Tough form to find. Other examples we've had in the past are a little bit wider at the top. These are, are definitely more delicate looking. A great John Bell mug. This is glazed almost in the fashion of Thomas Wielden from England. It bears that mark on the bottom, John Bell, circa 1840 to 1880. The condition's immaculate. I mean, this thing looks pretty much the way it did coming out of the kiln. High luster to the lead glaze. You can see more clearly that this was dipped in a, a white slip and then decorated with sponge manganese and then clear lead glazed. Uh, if you look at the interior, you can see that original base clay there. Another great mug in the Shenandoah school is this diminutive, look how small that is, Bacher mug. Bearing a highly, uh, bearing a highly uh, desirable glaze treatment that he used. We have this, this pastel green, almost like an eggshell green. Uh, he 
dip this piece in a, a cream colored slip decorated with marble manganese and then it appears that um, maybe the lead glaze was enhanced a little bit with copper or maybe the the base slip was enhanced a little bit with copper at any rate really produced a beautiful color that you don't find on a lot of his pottery most of his pottery you're going to see is cr uh, cream and brown there's his mark on the bottom Bacher Winchester VA a great miniature by John W. Bell. This is John Bell's son, and he owned the pottery after John Bell's death in 1880 into the mid-1890s. Possibly made as a, a gift or a child's toy. He's got that larger mark than his father had. You see John W. Bell, Waynesboro, PA. And so it really dominates the surface of this small pot. Again, another piece that's exceptionally clean, really, really beautifully glazed. Really wonderful condition. Another great example of Shenandoah pottery we'll be offering is the sugar bowl. Sugar bowls are generally a scarce form, but when you do find them, they're very often heavily damaged, missing the lid with an extreme number of chips. This is actually a contact mark from the firing. This retains its original lid in very nice condition. And then the the bowl itself is very nice, beautifully glazed. Beller Eberly from Strasbourg, 1890s. And we also have this. This is a very difficult to find form by John Bell from Waynesboro, a soap dish. A much earlier piece, and this, you know, people throw around the name Peter Bell all the time, and you know, it's very difficult to tell exactly. Uh, what he made, because there's only a couple sign examples, and the, the site that he worked at in Hagerstown had different potters working at it. But um, this is an exceptionally early and beautifully decorated example of early Hagerstown pottery, where Peter Bell worked and where John Bell, his son, learned the trade. And so you could throw around that name maybe with this, that it's possibly made by them, but I don't think we'll ever know. Um, it's dipped in this slip. Uh, with an underlying slip. So it's kind of interesting. You can see actually here, it was actually dipped in brown first. And you can see where the, the potter grabbed it and the brown is showing through. You see the brown on the inside. So it's a double, it's a double dipped piece, which is unusual. Brown and then cream. And that's one thing that could lend credence to maybe, maybe it is an early Bell piece because John Bell was messing around with a lot of double dipping of glazes and weird treatments later on in his career. This is about maybe 1815-ish. Exceptional squat form. We sold some other examples from this pottery or from this school of potters from Hagerstown, but they're almost always damaged. This one survives in really great condition and has that bold use of uh, three colors of slip. This last piece I'm gonna show you up top is a fabulous Solomon Bell plate an octagonal plate using the same mold that his brother John used, but of course you can see what really sets this apart is the bold use of copper slip decoration on the interior. Um, you can occasionally find these undecorated by John Bell uh, for maybe a few hundred dollars. This is a, an entirely different level, a highly important piece, uh, not only for its decoration, but for the impressed maker's mark. You see that right here, Solomon Bell Strasburg. So made search of 1850 to 1880 while Solomon was working in, Str in Strasbourg. This is probably a, a little bit towards the early years of, of that tenure because it lacks a Virginia below the mark. And I've only seen uh, one other example bearing this mark. This mark usually has three lines and you find it on a lot of his stoneware and, and, and a good amount of his redware as well. Solomon Bell, Strasbourg, VA. Lacking the VA um, indicates that this was probably produced earlier and it was a short-lived maker's mark when he was just getting into uh, using a stamp made by that stamp maker. But really beautiful piece, classic Solomon Bell tulip decoration. Um, and the, the color of green is, is really fantastic as well. It's that lighter, almost like a sea green. Kind of... Moving on, a great John Bell flower pot with Unusual coggling to the rim and base, also an unusual coggled form. John Bell flower pots typically have a tapered form, so this one's a little more ornate. The hands holding rings 
are also unusual at the shoulder. It has an early st uh, sticker on it from George S. McKieran, prominent glass and pottery collector. Very nice example. We have a couple of sugar bowls that, are, that, that bear that grape cluster, fish scale, seed pod, whatever you want to call it, decoration. Done with slip trail uh, humps accented on the interior. And these motifs are found on a plate that has a strong uh, Bell family attribution, actually attributed to Peter Bell. It's pictured in Rice and Stout's 1929 book. And so when we see this design, uh, it, it's often attributed to Peter Bell. They did do this design other places, so it's tough to say. Uh, regardless of maker, they certainly stand on their own. This is one of the most heavily decorated sugar bowls we've ever offered. And uh, it's really interesting, not only is it slip trailed with uh, manganese and yellow slip, but they've actually brushed these swags in there. This is the best picture of this form by Anthony Bacher that we've ever offered. I mean, you can see it's not only exceptionally large, it dwarfs the typical creamers that you find in, in Strasburg and Winchester, but uh, the glaze, the marbling on it is just fantastic. Very sophisticated glaze treatment. On the underside, we have that bold inscription, Anthony Bacher, of course, one of the leading potters uh, in the region. Moving along, we have some other Shenandoah potter, including another Hagerstown piece. This is a bowl, some Shenandoah flower pots, a nice pitcher and bowl set uh, with beautiful color on it, made by Jay Everly and Company, circa 1890. A couple of Dendalots, two rare pieces of JB Leathers pottery, including this uh, uh, batter pail. This is only the second Leathers batter pail we've ever offered. This thing is really in fabulous condition, retains its original tins. A leather is chick water, that's some damage on, on the reverse, unfortunately, but exceptionally rare form. An extremely rare West, Westler and Edwards Berwick PA batter pail with a made to handle. Uh, here's a, a, a beautifully decorated Cowden Wilcox batter pail that has, uh, unfortunately, some restoration, but a really Stunning design by one of PA's leading pottery companies. A rare T. Harrington, but instead of having the, the star face, uh, the, the flower in the center of the star, we have this daisy motif in, in the center, which is unusual. A selection of, of pictures, a nice three color slip deal pottery, Pennsylvania plate. Moving along, we have this uh, Incredible oversized jug made for uh, a local grocer, WH, it should be Trafagan, but it's actually spelled Trafugan. And this depicts the number of stars uh, that were on the American flag with the inception of the state of Michigan. So this is sort of a commemorative piece to Michigan's admission to the Union. This is, was made much later, about 1880. but. When we're talking a, a combination of factors uh, on this piece, uh, we're really talking a special piece. We have a piece that's, that's made for the Michigan market, uh, probably in Akron, Ohio, based on the form. We have a piece picturing a flag on it. We also have a piece of exceptional size and a nice open handle form. So you're really combining form, origin, and decoration to create a real masterwork uh, of Midwestern stoneware. A very, very special piece, a unique piece for sure. Um, and we're, we're very excited to offer it uh, in our summer auction. Moving along, we have one of the best single pheasants by the Norton Pottery that we've ever offered. This bears the mark J. Norton and Company, circa 1860. You can see just how bold the blue is. It's a term among collectors, Benny Blue. If there ever was a, a Benny Blue, this would be it. Um, really beautiful design and a little more detail than you typically see uh, in the body of the bird. This is a piece that this was a mystery to us for, for quite some time in terms of who exactly uh, this portrayed. Our initial thought was an Indian, then we thought it was a, a form of military a figure called a sapper, a military engineer, because they wore these hats. Uh, I thought it might be a Hessian soldier. Uh, this, is, this is, in the end, more than likely 
uh, an Indian based on, on the advice of, of uh, uh, one person, uh, a possible Seneca Indian based on that head wrapping. And you know, we couldn't wrap our heads around <laughs> what exactly this, this, this hat ornamentation, this head ornament, ornamentation, this figure hat was, but um, this is probably a Seneca head wrap with a, with a feather coming out of it. You can see that's pretty clearly a tomahawk. And then we also found Seneca Indians that have a uh, very similar uh, detailed uh, clothing. Really special piece to have a, a full body figure. You can see just how big that is covering really the whole front and also a rare mark for penny and stoneware. Um, it certainly is among the very best examples made in that, that village in New York. Here's a, a really wonderful crossover piece. Uh, if you're into circus memorabilia or you're into American pottery, this is this is right up your alley. Of course, we see it depicts Jumbo, the famous circus elephant that was bought by P.T. Barnum uh, and tragically died in a railroad accident in the 1880s. He acquired it from the London Zoo for $10,000 and made that money back in three weeks. Um, Barnum was quite the businessman, and so he, uh, of course, got a good deal out of that one, uh, much to the chagrin of a lot of uh, London citizens who were sad to see their elephant go but he toured this elephant around the country sometimes with a smaller elephant called tom thumb that we believe is this elephant depicted and um when jumbo was hit by a train uh tom thumb was apparently on the scene too and, and barnum kind of spun a yarn which people don't really believe is actually the truth that that uh Jumbo saw the train coming on and, and, and he saw uh, Tom Thumb wandering along the tracks and he went to save Tom Thumb and, and then he got hit. But um, uh, an amazing uh, figure in American circus history, probably the most famous American circus performer. I mean, a, re a really uh, amazing uh, animal, larger than life. Again, it, I think it was... Um, something like uh, 13 feet or so that, that, that Barnum said uh, this, this elephant stood. And apparently, I, I believe I read somewhere, somewhere around a little over 10 feet. So he was, he was always kind of lying about things. But the, the maker is Somerset Potter's Works from Somerset, Massachusetts. Uh, they did some other stencil work and some other brush designs. But this, this is the, the pinnacle of what was produced there. And there's only a handful of these known and I was talking earlier with the McCoy elephant head, um, how special an elephant design is on American Sower. In this case, you have two elephants and they're, they're really nicely executed with brushed cobalt around the stenciling. Um, really special piece, possibly made in small number when Jumbo visited a nearby town or maybe Somerset itself in, in Massachusetts. But we're delighted to have that in this sale. Uh, here is the best T.H. Wilson jar that we've ever had really speaks for itself. Look at the blue on that. I mean, any potter during the time period would love to get that effect on their wear. It's this enamel-like cobalt, almost Bennington-esque. T.H. Uh, Wilson and Company, Harrisburg, PA, an 1850s mark. Unusual form that you see associated with earlier Hagerstown, uh, I'm sorry, earlier Harrisburg pieces, but not really later on with Calden and Wilcox. We have this thin rim, this semi-ovoid form. Floral design is exceptional. Likely executed or inspired by Shem Thomas, a New York trained potter. Um, you see that strong New York influence, that distinctive little tornado squiggle there. You have almost like Phil Fots or stylized stars at the centers of the blossom. A very special piece. Unusual in its size, but really over the top in its decoration. Highly important example of early Harrisburg stoneware. Uh, this is the best Samuel Hart Fulton, New York dog. Of course, we showed you this, the uh, Ordelia Hart miniature churn made for Charles Hart's daughter before. This was made by Samuel Hart in Fulton, New York. Uh, normally when you see these dogs, they're on a larger crock. They're sometimes bubbled uh, severely. They don't have this quality of blue. This one has a really nice large size dog on it. It's, re it's really covering the front well and it's executed in really bold cobalt.
Um, a, a really great example of, of Samuel Hart's premier design. Moving along, we have this highly important Ohio jug with incised snakes decorated with brush spots. An exotic bird. Foliate mot motifs. And then the inscription Africa. A face on the back possibly represents an African-American figure, but it's a little difficult to say. The bird possibly represents a hoopoe, which is an African native bird that has a distinctive crest and a long bill and a split tail. Um, but this is a, such a wonderful piece not just in its folk art quality, in its rendering of these animals and these other designs, but also in its social commentary. And we have the word Africa mentioned, and we really think this may have to do with the American Colonization Society's uh, Back to Africa movement, um, the, the, the whole founding of Liberia, which, which was an idea thrown about a lot during the 19th century. And it seems that in this reference to Africa, this piece, which based on the form and the spout was probably made in Muskingum County, Ohio, mid 19th century. Um, the potter is, is giving his own kind of rendition of what the exotic place of Africa looks like. And so we have a native bird and we have these snakes. And um, it's possible that he drew inspiration with this decoration from something he had seen in a book that talks about exotic locales in the world. But the way the snakes are done in particular are really noteworthy. You can see it's kind of a mixed media decoration and that these are incised. Uh, the teeth of the figure are incised, but nothing else on this is, in, is incised. And then they're filled in in blue. We can even see the head of a snake here, lightly incised, that's uh, not completed. Very special piece. We have something else going on down here that was kind of a, uh, an, omitted, um, an omitted idea after the potter got started. But a really, really wonderful piece that we, we feel kind of combines the social climate of the period with also the, the folk aesthetic that you associate with some of the better examples of Midwestern stoneware. Here's a, a, a very important piece made by the African-American potter, Thomas Comerall in Manhattan, New York. The reason this piece is so special is because it bears Comerall's earliest mark Corlear's hook featuring an E after the O, then N York on the reverse. This predates the well known Comrall Stoneware Corlear's hook New York Maker's Mark or Corlear's hook N York Maker's Mark that you'll see. And it features freehand incising. So this is one of only a handful of jars or pieces that we can say were made by Thomas Comrall from head to toe, start to finish right around the time he started his pottery in 1795. So we're, we're talking still in the 18th century that this jar was made. And it was a time where he's trying to establish himself as a potter. And so his ware is exceptionally well made. The, the firing, the color of these pieces are very often in a lighter gray. The decoration is not these uh, impressed designs. He's impressed what they call drape and tassel designs or clamshell designs. They're freehand incised. Uh, in the in the manner of the Crolius family where he learned the trade on Pot Baker's Hill. And that's another point that's important to be made about this piece. It's actually featured on the cover of Brant Zipp's uh, book on Thomas Comerall. Um, and the reason why he chose it for that is because it shows a clear link between Thomas Comerall and his training with the Crolius family in this Crolius motif. Other pieces, there's an example of the Met, uh, there's one at the Fenimore Art Museum. There's, there's some here and there. 
do not feature this Crawley's design. They feature a, a somewhat different design, usually kind of a fanned flower with two of these bulbs sticking off the back of it. But you can see, it's amazing, as he went off on his own from Bob Baker's Hill to this small kind of bad part of town in Corlear's Hook. Um, it, it must have been a, a scary experience and a big adjustment, but, but he came through with wear that really challenged the stuff that was being made uh, on Pot Baker's Hill by the Crowleys and the Remy families. It's beautiful stuff. And uh, of particular note on this example is the condition. A lot of these are missing a handle or two and have significant losses. You can see there's some cracking here, um, but nothing uh, too egregious wrong with this. For whatever reason, his, there was just not a good survival rate of these pots. And when you do find them, they're damaged. Um, Take a look at the blue as well. I want to make a note of that. Step aside so Brandon can get a good shot of the blue. Uh, the blue is is exceptionally vibrant and strong. It's almost electric. Um, and we don't exactly know how he achieved that, but he must have been, been pleased with it. But you don't typically find the blue. It almost looks like uh, indigo ink uh, on Manhattan pieces from that period. So he really hit on this example, um, and we're excited that it survived, and of course excited to present it uh, to you in this auction. Next to it is a masterwork of Boston stoneware. This is Jonathan Fenton from Boston, Massachusetts. It bears his mark, Boston. It's inter interesting to note, so many of these early American potters, they did not put their names on these pieces, just like we have Corlier's hook written on that. It doesn't say Comoros. Stoneware, anything like that. It does not say Fenton on here. It says Boston. These people seem to be promoting the idea that they were selling locally made ware uh, that was made in the newly founded country. They were, seemed a little more in, involved in, in that aspect of it rather than promoting their own personal manufacture of it. But what sets this piece apart is this bird with grapes motif impressed four times on the one side. And the brush tree that they're in, creating an, an entire scene, highly unusual. Um, you just don't see that on Fenton's work. Typically, you'll see one impressed bird, you'll see one impressed fish, you'll see one impressed flower. This is four of those birds on one side, and he's put them in a tree. Very nice color, classical form. One of the things people love about Fenton's work is his potting. He had these very high styled classical open handled forms with flared rims and nice tooling. And then on the other side, we have a single impressed bird. If you found a jar stamped Boston uh, with a single bird, it would be noteworthy. The bird motif is exceptionally rare. We've only sold one or two of them. Uh, but in this case, we have that bird impressed a total of five times on the same piece. So certainly one of the best examples of, of Jonathan Fenton Stoneware known. We sold a fabulous presentation jar made by Fenton that had a freehanded sized bird on it a few years ago. Uh, next to that example, this is the best example of his work that we've ever had, and it might be the best stamped uh, decorated example of his work known. He's, he's more well known for using these stamps. Um, and just a really fabulous piece. Honored to have it in this sale. Moving on, we have a great example of Colin Rhodes stoneware from Edgefield, South Carolina. This was made about 1850. Uh, what sets it apart are, are two factors. We have Colin Rhodes' signature here, C. Rhodes Maker. Tough to find examples of Rhodes stoneware with an actual signature on it. But then we have this desirable double-handled form, this big uh, jug form that required two handles for, for carrying the heavy liquid inside. And that's one of the premier forms from Edgefield. Uh, they're, they're scarce. People uh, really are drawn to them for their uh, size, rarity, and their, their kind of sculptural form. We have distinctive road style slip trailing on the back, these scalloped leaves at the base of the plant, and these tassel shaped flowers, and these this daisy type blossom at the top. Iron slip decoration of the handles. So this is actually using two colors of slip. Um, and then the front, of course, with the signature and the wreath around it. And the white, the slip, it's all kaolin slip, locally sourced kaolin. 
there are these kaolin mines uh, in Edgefield and they had heavy access to that. They were not just using that for the slip decoration, they were using it for the teeth and the eyes on the face jugs that are well known from that region. We have a four for four gallons within a floral motif. This is one of the best pieces of road stone we've ever offered. And it's really in immaculate condition. I mean, it's remarkable. This descended in the family of the owner of the Beale Springs Hotel, which is in Warrington, Georgia. And Beale Springs were one of the popular resort areas throughout the country during the time period that promoted the healing properties, the health properties of this spring water. And so it makes us wonder if this was used in the hotel, this is a particularly large jug, maybe it was used to carry Beale Springs famous spring water. A very special piece, the first time this has ever been offered for sale since Colin Rhodes uh, sold it and it ended up at that hotel. It's an important new discovery in Southern pottery. Another example of a double handled jug. This was made by the venerable potter, David Drake, one of the most famous potters in American history. You can see that Drake has inscribed it with the date July 10th, 1852, extending diagonally down the body of the jug. We also see other Dave treatments, including punctates at the shoulder right here. And Dave's enigmatic, but well-known horseshoe motif. This double handled form is one of Dave's rarest forms. There's not many of these known. Um, as I, I said before on the rose piece, they're, they're rare for the region. They're even rarer when we're talking about Dave's work. Uh, amazingly, both handles are intact. I believe there's some restoration to some chipping or uh, crack going through one of the handles and there is some restoration of the body. Nonetheless, that is a nice example of this elusive form by Dave that actually is hand inscribed by him. So uh, we're excited to have that in this auction. Again, you can see, as often seen on Dave Potts, we have this interesting modeling in the glaze, the glaze runs, the lighter areas of application that show that reddish brown clay below. And of course, Dave's typical thin step spout. That's one of the diagnostic traits of his work. Here's a significant recent discovery in Ohio stoneware. This was made for F. Bear, a wine and liquor merchant from Toledo, Ohio. In our research, we found he operated sometime in the early 1890s. Exceptional size. Again, we have some real monsters in this sale. We have the, the Michigan jug over there with the, the flag on it, and we have this. Uh, what really sets this apart, of course, is the incredible coverage of the inscription on the front and the manner in which it is executed. You can see just how big this cooler is and they've really used that space as a canvas for advertising. This, as with the Michigan flag job, no doubt sat in a storefront. These were, these were advertising pieces. They may not have been used much at all, uh, but you can imagine this man has a liquor store. Instead of getting a trade sign, what does he get? He gets a large jug form cooler to have his name and the products he sells on it. But look at the deep in sizing here. And Brank, if you can get in close and show this, it's really remarkable. They've used a very wide tool and carved very deeply to put this name within the banner on it and then a smaller tool, but still exceptionally large to do this other lettering. We have three, three petaled flower or foliate motif at the top, stylized sunburst motifs, motifs here, flanking the, the banner. A really gutsy, bold piece. It's got so much crossover appeal, not just you know, it's not just a piece for stoneware collectors. It could be a piece for advertising collectors. It could be a piece for 
uh, wine and liquor memorabilia collectors. Um, it's almost like a pop art piece. It's really wonderful. And uh, we're, we're elated to have it. It's always cool to see something new and something different. And when we see incising done in that manner, um, it really makes us take notice. We have, as I said, a few really important large size examples of pottery in this sale. If you're interested in them at all, you should come see them in person because they are all the more dramatic when you see them with your own eyes in person. This is another great new discovery. You can count on one hand how many pieces bear an inscription from a major potter in Manhattan. And this is one of them, John Remy. We know from a few documents that this is not the signature of perhaps the most well-known John Remy, John Remy III, who actually stamped his, his pieces uh, during the early 19th century. This is probably his father, which would date this piece exceptionally early, 1780s. So it'd be one of the earlier pieces that actually has this style of spout. This was purchased by the consigner in the, in the 1970s and it's, it had been in his collection ever since. And when he contacted with us, we were floored because this really is one of those Rosetta stones. There's very little known collectively about what all the Remy's were doing in, in New York. There's a little more well known about what the Crolliuses were doing. And so this piece really stands as an exceptionally early, possibly the earliest sod example of Remy stone or from, from Manhattan uh, that gives us some insight into what they were doing there. Highly important piece. It's a beautiful example of Calden and Wilcox bird motif. This example depicts the bird within a reef. Unusual standing stance. He's actually standing on a little stylized mound there. Uh, typically when you see these bird and reef motifs, they'll be almost nesting. You don't see their, the, the, the bottom of their body, their legs. Uh, but in this case, he's actually standing in the middle of it, well-executed wreath around it. You can see some of that Lions, New York influence in that decoration. Um, anytime you get a bird by Calvin, it's something to uh, take note of. A special piece that came out of a, an old long-term collection in Pennsylvania. The Great Manhattan Bird. Probably Crolius family, but it's it's difficult to say. These are almost never signed. This appears to be a raven. The turned head. See that little bump there at the tip of the beak for anatomical accuracy. Beautiful color. Slightly earlier period jug, and so we have that nice color to both the cobalt and the gray, that kind of uh, deteriorated over time as the potters made more and more things. 1790s piece, really beautiful example of a desirable motif. This piece is pictured in Great Noble Jar. Very important piece of Edgefield stoneware made at the J.P. Bodie Pottery, Kirksey's Crossroads. When we think of Kirksey's Crossroads, we also think, of course, of Thomas Chandler. But this example is made special with its inscription by two cooperative potters, Horn and DeVore, Kirk Kirksey's, and instead of writing cross, they just wrote Kirksey Kirksey's X Roads, Edgefield County, South Carolina, July 30th, 1874. This is kind of a document in clay of that one particular day when they were working together. And for whatever reason, they decided to put this long inscription on it. Two gowns at the top with this wavy line around it, kind of like you'll find on some of the earlier uh, Rhodes and Chandler pieces where we'll have a numeral with a scalloped border. Here's another example of Dave Stoneware. This is a rare survivor. You can see it's missing its handles. It has a wire around the top. Uh, what it does have is a wonderful inscription, a very deep and uh, legible inscription featuring David Drake's, uh, the, the initials of David Drake's master at the time, Lewis Miles. At this point in Dave's working career, if you can call it a, a career, uh, he was working at Lewis Miles Stony Bluff Manufactory. And uh, for whatever reason, Lewis Miles 
was one owner that would allow Dave to inscribe his work fairly regularly. And so you see a number of different dates uh, from the 1840s, 1850s, and the early 1860s. In this case, we have July 21st, 1853. But very deep, bold, tactile incising. Again, he's putting his owner's initials on here. He's putting the date more when it was made. And then we have four punk dates for four gallons. And another mark, we talked about the enigmatic horseshoe mark, another Dave uh, hallmark, these, these, these slashes. We don't know what they mean, but Dave did put that on a lot of his work. Interesting glaze, it's drier at the base, wetter at the top. You can see it is flowing down. It may have been poured on it, but we have these interesting colorful greenish runs where it's where it's heaviest. This is a recently surfaced piece, fresh to the market, and we're glad to have it. Of course, any pieces by Drake are are important documents to America's past, and we're Always excited to get them. A great example of heart stoneware. This was made at the Samuel Hart Pottery, the same site as that great dog I showed you. This is another iconic design from that shop, the, the cross birds or love birds. In this case, it's made a little more unusual with the impressed advertising. So you can see that. That, that advertising for Adams Center, New York, dealers in dry goods, groceries, clothing, and C. And then we have Johnny W. Sitzer. This was the potter. This was actually the maker. Brand, Brand and I sat down and tried to find out who what this name was. Uh, it looked kind of like Titus. And then we said, no, that's an S. And we, we did a little research. Johnny W. Sitzer is actually listed as a brick maker in, in Fulton. And so he was no doubt a potter too. But to have a piece uh, hand incised by the potter is really noteworthy. And then of course, to have that, that nice advertising too. This is a more special, more special example, maybe the best example of uh, the Hearts double burr motif that we've ever had. A great example of Brown Brothers stoneware. This is one of their highly prized epigraph crocs. In this case, it says my love and me. Maybe it was made for uh, a potter's wife. Maybe it was made to be given to somebody who specially ordered it for his wife. Maybe it was just made as a fun whimsy, but there's all sorts of inscriptions that they did. Some are, some are romance based. Other ones say other things. They're kind of like old adages, uh, but there's not many of them known. Um, there's, there's very few of these known for whatever reason. They did not uh, inscribe many of their, their pots with anything. This you can see was, um, either executed with a slip cup or a brush. But for you pottery collectors out there, collect with your wives. <laughs> great, great Valentine's Day gift. Um, and you can see that oval mark, that distinctive mark top, Brown Brother, where it, it lacks the S, Huntington, Long Island. A nice Milburn jar, BC Milburn 6. Beautiful decoration, brushed on it, made during the late 1850s. A nice Alabama piece. Again, we're talking about that two color slip, just like I showed on those two jars over there. A lighter kind of cream green slip with a brown dip around the top and then distinctive sine wave motif uh, that you associate with the Sand Mountain region there. A rare Akron, Ohio croc, six gallon featuring an eagle. And again, we talked about potteries, not touting the maker, but touting the, the town or city of origin. In this case, this eagle is touting with his speech bubble, hey, this was made in Akron, Ohio. And Akron was one of the meccas of stoneware production in the Midwest. This was no doubt saying, this is an Akron made croc. This is a good croc. A great L. Norton cooler. I'm gonna to try to take this off gingerly and show it because it has a very interesting construction. We have that Mark L. Norton Bennington with a bird. This predates John Hilfinger's involvement with the pottery, so it's brushed, and it's not that typical slip-trailed bird on branch or uh, pheasant motif or any of those birds that you would associate from the 1850s. This, is, this was made uh, a couple decades earlier, and so uh, to have a bird that's this early is unusual. The form is exceptional. It's a cooler form, but what really makes it fantastic is... 
this double spouted form. You can see here, this thing was made with two spouts. And my guess is that it may have been seated on some kind of wooden stand in a hotel or somewhere that got a lot of traffic and you could access it from either side. At any rate, we have two-sided decorations, so it kind of had told its own little decorative story based on which way you looked at it. And it's also impressed on both sides. So it's clearly meant to be viewed from, from both sides as well. A really great piece that recently surfaced in, in the southeastern US. We have a great spotted dog by C.W. Braun. Tough to find dog decorations by any maker. Nice large rooster by Janie e. Norton. A beautiful example of Canadian advertising stoneware from Chatham, Canada West. With this painterly design of a large bird on a, on a more lightly brushed uh, stump on the ground. Really delicate brushwork. Beautiful piece. A couple things down here. Great example of White's Utica stoneware. One of the best examples of White's we've ever had. Featuring three colors of slip. Rebecca at the well motif. And then a classical bust on the reverse. A rare Ohio cooler made for local merchant in Dresden, Ohio, N.C. Bryant. A rare Evan R. Jones with a flying dove with olive branch motif that we've never seen before. A rare example of Pittston stoneware by Evan R. Jones that features brushed and slip trail design in the extremely rare freehand inscription Pittston. A great example of Palatine stoneware inscribed Eagle Pottery with the Federal Eagle banner and this bold brushwork associated with that town's potting school. Beautiful Old Bridge, New Jersey jug that is actually uh, mentioned, uh, or, or I believe was actually in the, I think it is in the, yeah, it was previously Sim collection. So Sim and Brown were the two big scholars for, for these jugs, uh, for the Old Bridge pottery. They dug the sites, they're the first people to kind of put that pottery on the map. And this has that old Sim collection uh, label, you can barely read it, but it has, uh, uh, this exceptionally early, almost like a gauze tape or something from a hospital. Sim, C-O-L-L. -L. Um, beautiful example of an early Federal Eagle design. This is an exceptionally large medallion that you don't typically see. And then these elliptical incised designs, almost like Warren and Letts from South Amboy. But this strongly attributed to Old Ridge based on the form and the, and the decoration on it. Here's a great example of... Jonathan Fenton stoneware that actually bears the potter's uh, initials. So we talked earlier about the, the Boston jar that has the uh, impressed bird motif and it's just stamped Boston. Typically you'll see his thing stamped Boston. You have no idea that he was the maker. In this case, this one particular cartouche, it has these crossed initials that if you study them closely actually say JF for Jonathan Fenton. This is one of his rarer stamp designs. A really special cooler made in Baltimore. Brand, if you could look inside, show the viewers what's in there. We have, it's a two piece cooler that separates. This actually is the original filtering disc. This is perforated. These are the original uh, pieces of, of wax or resin, something that actually held it in place. It's all intact. This is, we're talking from the 1830s, mid 1830s Baltimore. This is all intact, it's remarkable. Um, I'm going to pick it up real quick and show you what that filter went through. So it went through this channel at the base and then see if you can get the underside. Do you get that? The underside's pierced. And so this was a water filter that would fit inside the water cooler and come out right here. And these are advertised in Baltimore by Margaret Parr, the widow of famous Baltimore potter, David Parr Sr., who died of cholera. 
And Margaret Parr is a, an influential, important figure in American pottery that has is, is kind of been lost to history. And uh, Luke Zip here has been uh, working to kind of uh, regain her some recognition. Uh, this was made in the 1830s, shortly after David Parr died. And Margaret Parr took over and managed the pottery. So we have a rare example of a female pottery owner, a female pottery manager that actually advertised the pottery with her own name, a female entrepreneur um, in the early American South. So very, very cool thing. You will find later examples of this form with the typical Baltimore clover design going up the front, a clover plant. This is an exceptionally rare example uh, in that it is earlier it features this flare-rimmed form that you just don't normally see. This is more typical to earlier David Parr jars. And this swag and floral motif and capacity mark dated, dated all earlier. So this is like the very origin of that mark made by um, an important maker. Another Parr piece, Elisha Parr. This is a water cooler, the only water cooler known bearing the mark of Elisha Parr, an 1820s mark. And I believe Elisha died of cholera uh, during the epidemic. An exceptionally rare cooler bearing the stamp of John Brelsford from Philadelphia. It's a Baltimore-ish slash Remy-ish design. Uh, but in this case, we know the maker because it bears his mark, which is exceptionally rare. One of only a few examples known. If you open up Handcraft Industry, Susan Meyer's book, you'll see some mention of Brelsford, but that is Definitely one of the lesser known Philadelphia potters. Unusual cool, cooler, Northeastern with this scroll and, and floral motif going around it. And then we're gonna head to the center room here. One of the great things about collecting Western Pennsylvania stoneware is the use of freehand brushwork and stenciled elements. It's a very eye appealing, aesthetic the collectors just love. And in this case, we have these beautiful tulip motifs going around the shoulder. The striping, as we discussed before, so so prevalent in that area, but done to a, in a, to a really profuse extent um, at the shoulder and midsection. And then the stenciled name A.V. Buffner, a rare mark from Greensboro. The Buffners produce some of the very best stoneware in Greensboro. It's considered scarce. The most desirable examples by the Buchner family are these examples that feature the stencil signature as well as other stenciled elements and then freehand brush decoration. We can see these graduated stripes below, this vining in between, they're really sparing no space on this piece. Vining at the base, a freehand four, and then uh, the highly prized thistle motif from Greensboro that sometimes you'll see on canners and you'll see it on some of Buchner's work. Uh, the color's great. We have a chip here, we have a sealed crack here. Other than that, the condition is great. You can see just how beautiful it is. Um, whether you collect Western PA somewhere or not, it's certainly a piece to appreciate. It's also a little bit wider and squatter than you typically see from pieces from that region. It's a very special new discovery. Another piece that has fantastic decoration, really great color as well as this BC Milburn jar. One of the best brush decorated jars by Milburn we've ever had. Has this flowering plant go, grow, uh, growing up the front, these Germanic tulips, and then these other heavily brushed tulips right there. The reverse features the iconic with Eddie Wilder, the late uh, historian on Alexandria Potter we call the Alexandria motif. This sunflower, with these sprigs coming out of it. Really beautiful piece. Uh, and we can attribute it firmly to a potter working there named James Shinnick because this design, particularly these right here, you will see brought down to Strasburg, Virginia and used at the Keister and LaHue potteries. And you'll also see it in Mount Crawford, Virginia where Shinnick worked. A great example of Alexandria, Virginia stoneware. It's a special Calton piece. We see that Lions or New York State influence in its slip trail decoration. This star is exceptionally rare. And not only is it a star, but we have these wonderful details throughout and these uh, almost foliate-like 
details. Very reminiscent of some, some pottery you would, you would typically associate with uh, New York State, but it bears the mark of Central PA Potters, Count and Wilcox. A great example of the popular chick waterer form from Philadelphia. It's a great large size chick water. You can see it's impressed two at the shoulder. Really nice, almost like a tree of life design coming up out of the watering area. You can see how complex these forms were to produce. You had to throw that, that bullet, that beehive form first. And then as you finish it off, put that finial on it. You had to apply these handles. Then you had to throw a second smaller beehive. Cut that and let it sit a little bit. Let, you know, let it firm up, cut that in half, and apply that on here, and then cut this out. It's a painstaking process. I'm sure a lot of these were lost in the firing because they wouldn't adhere right. I also think that these potters probably made them in, in, in pairs or groups of two because you kind of had to, you had to cut that, that piece and you have another half of it left over every time. But the water will be filled up in here and uh, you can fill the whole, the whole uh, reservoir up and then it would stop here in the trough and they drink out of it. And as they drank, it would, it would slowly come down. Great condition. These were obviously made for outdoor use. There weren't chickens and poultry running around in people's living rooms. So uh, you typically find them with freeze cracks, chips, uh, missing handles, missing finials, all those sorts of things. This survives in really strong condition. Uh, classic Remy decoration from the fourth quarter of the, of the 19th century, 1875, 85, somewhere in there. One of the better examples of this form you've ever offered. Here's one of the best single chicken, chicken pecking corns we've ever had. This was made by New York Stoneware Company. Um, and you can see uh, it has this heavily slip trailed chicken, really nicely done. These nice little, I've seen, seen heard people call this a chicken pecking corn on wheels. It's really just a, a floral motif done with these stylized circular blossoms, but it's on a six gallon cooler, which, which really sets it apart. Uh, you don't see this decoration uh, generally on coolers and you typically don't, don't find uh, it on a six gallon jug form cooler. So uh, it's a special piece that, that combines a well-known, well-loved design on an exceptional form. And it, that, that's what really sets it apart. Another example of Michigan stoneware, we're making Michigan stoneware look a little more common and it's certainly not, it's exceptionally rare. This was made by Bosley in Detroit. Uh, we have another couple of examples uh, by that potting firm in, in this sale. And uh, it's exceptionally early. Um, you can see it says number 10, 1859. Just a very er early piece for that pottery. Presentation piece that again, probably sat in a storefront. I'm talking, uh, talking earlier about these large, oversized pieces in this auction. This is definitely one of them. In this case, it was made for L. Bradley, a wholesale grocer in Marshall. Really beautiful brushwork surrounding it, almost forms a heart. Um, but you can imagine this sitting in the storefront window and storing grain or something like that. A utilitarian pot that also kind of served as a trade sign. With free, having two freehand inscriptions on it, both for the potter and for the owner, exceptionally rare. Uh, we're going to walk around here and then I'll show you the, the last masterpiece in this sale that we'll be selling a lot number one. Really nice selection of Northeastern stoneware here. Uh, here's that, that Mark Balsley again. These, this is beaver trained, uh, beaver trained potters uh, from T.S. Uh, Balsley, Detroit, Michigan. Um, and you'll see, you see the, the huge, the, I mean, you know, our, our initial thought was this is beaver PA. We've been talking about it here. And, there's some thought that it might actually be a Detroit piece made with um, imported beaver clay, but looks exactly like a Western PA pot, but has that Detroit mark on the back. Very rare piece, the only piece with that stamp I've seen. Nice examples of Crolius right here, some birds, some rare Fredericksburg, Virginia advertising pieces, a nice bust piece and a Midwestern uh, point in hand piece. Some really good Calden that we have. You can see this is almost all Calden right here from Harrisburg. Nice selection of Bennington birds here. We have some pheasants, we have some songbirds. 
One piece that I don't want to miss is this incredible sculptural piece of chemical stoneware. And Brandon, if you could come in here and get that mark, that mark is fantastic. R.C. Remy, Phila, January 12th, 1869, patented, and it's a 30 gallon. A two to three piece construction, a mo real monster. Salt glazed surface. They threw these other cylinders on here that, that are part of the form. They threw this small jug top to put on here. Really different pocket handles here. Uh, if you're into Remy stoneware, you're into large pieces, you're into unusual forms, you're into oversized pieces, this is, um, this is really up your alley. Really different piece. Some Northeastern stoneware here, primarily New York State including some Rochester and Cortland pieces, some more Northeastern pottery, some Western PA, and uh, some other Northeastern pieces, a nice Albany, New York bird, some Western PA down here, Western PA and West Virginia over here. With a large selection of Donahoe pottery in this sale, and you'll see some of that here. There's a nice Palatine, here's a nice Rager Lloyd piece from Palatine. Mixed of Mid Atlantic pottery here. Mixed of Pennsylvania, New York State primarily here, including unusual heart horse head and a rare uh, brawn house. And then last but not least, we have this masterwork of American folk art, transcendent of American pottery, this West Troy pottery barrel of exceptional large size and extraordinary decoration featuring a town scene. The central three-story building here with three spires, one surmounted by a flag. A smaller structure here, and if you can get it up close on that, it's interesting in that the decorators actually put an incised arrow weather vane on top of it. Moving along over to this side, we have a body of water executed in lighter brushed cobalt with a sailboat on it. We have fences in the background and the foreground and this incredible foliage throughout, these, these trees, uh, these reeds here. And so much of it is done with a sponge, which is unusual. You typically don't see that uh, treatment. Uh, a really remarkable design. It's reminiscent of the Broadway cooler that we sold a few years ago by Ferrar of Gettys. It's reminiscent of some of the large kegs that the Nortons produced, uh, these specially ordered kegs with scenes on them. Um, you just don't see pieces like this come out anymore. These are almost all owned by museums. And uh, this particular piece, when it first sold back in the early 80s, set a near record price for American stoneware. It was recognized as a special piece even back then. Um, it's been privately owned since then. To bring something like this to the forefront is always exciting. To, to, to have something uh, this special, this different, uh, this mind-blowing, it, it, it always gets our blood pumping. You know, they, they, each sale we have, we're always trying to think, well, what's the next great thing we can get? What, you know, can we outdo ourselves? Is there, is there, are there any other really great things that are available? And then, and then this comes along. We're, we're super excited to have it. It's almost like a Hudson River scene uh, in clay. You know, you could read this as a painting, uh, but it's on a utilitarian crock. It's really remarkable. And Brandon, if you swing around here, you can show the back. The back actually has the mark again, West Troy Pottery. This is West Troy, New York, 1870s. A unique object. And this was a particularly long video. We want to thank you all for joining us for it. Uh, if you'd like to bid on anything or have any questions or comments, you can reach us at info at crockerfarm.com or at 410-472-2016 to speak directly to a member of the Zip family. Thank you so much for joining us.